We again have three scripture readings this afternoon, fairly short ones. Uh, we'll begin by looking at Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40, we'll look at the first five verses, then we'll turn to Malachi 2, and then to Mark chapter 1, which will be our text. So Isaiah 40, looking at the first five verses. Isaiah 40, starting at verse 1. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. She has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be, be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now we turn to Malachi chapter 2, right at the end of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 2. And we'll start at verse 17 and read through verses 3, verse 5. You have wearied the Lord with your words, but you say, how have we wearied him? By saying, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or by asking, where is the God of justice? Behold. I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. And they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offspring of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. Now we turn to the Gospel of Mark. Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, and we'll read the first 13 verses. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of the sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. When he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. 
And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. J.C. Ryle, in his book, Holiness, comments on how important it is for Christians to be very, very familiar with the four Gospels. And he says this. He says, it would be well if professing Christians in modern days studied the four Gospels more than they do. Now, why do I say this? I say it because I want professing Christians to know more about Christ. It is well to be acquainted with all the doctrines and principles of Christianity, but it is better to be acquainted with Christ himself. The Gospels were written to make men familiar with Christ, and therefore I wish men to study the Gospels. It is of eternal significance that we would never forget that at the heart and center of Christianity, stands a living relationship with the person of Jesus Christ. I've said it often, but I'll say it again. Growing in spiritual maturity fundamentally is about knowing Christ. It's about trusting Christ, walking with Christ, imitating Christ, loving Christ. And as Ryle notes, one of the best ways to keep this as our focus is to study the gospel accounts because of the way in which they set Christ before us personally. And it is primarily with that in mind that I want to begin this afternoon a series of sermons on the Gospel of Mark, that we might, as Ryle says, become more and more acquainted with Christ himself. And before we look at Mark's introduction, these introductory verses, I want to just give you a few brief overarching details about the book. The Gospel of Mark was written by John Mark, He was a disciple in the early church. He spent some time with both the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter. However, there's good evidence to support the early church tradition that standing behind Mark's account was actually the testimony of the Apostle Peter, and that Mark more or less served as a scribe, that he wrote down Peter's testimony. Now, among what we call the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which have a lot of similarities, Mark is unique in that he presents Christ very much as a man of action. He's very fond of using the word immediately. Mark's gospel moves along at a very quick pace. And Mark focuses less upon the actual teaching of Christ and more upon his ministry and upon his works. If you have a a red letter Bible that highlights, that makes red the, the words of Jesus, you can flip through and you'll notice that there's less long chunks of red in the Gospel of Mark than there would be in Matthew or in Luke. And so Mark focuses on the life of Christ, the works of Christ, the actions of Christ. Mark is very concerned to show us by his life who Jesus is and what he came to do. He's earnest to prove to us that the crucified Christ is both Lord and Savior. He wants to press everyone who reads his gospel to take Christ's claims seriously. Mark's great purpose, as he sets before us the life and the death of Christ, is that we would find the answers to three incredibly important questions. The first question is the question that Christ asks asks his disciples in chapter 8. Who do you say that I am? It's the question, who who is this Jesus? The answer that Mark will give us is that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. The second question Mark wants to present before us is the question, what did he come to do? What did Christ come to do? The answer that Mark gives us is in chapter 10. Son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Then Mark's third question is, do we understand and will we heed Christ's call to discipleship? Christ comes in the gospel of Mark with authority. 
And he calls people to follow him, even though following him means walking down the same path that he walked, the path of the cross, the path of self-denial, the path of suffering. Well, as we come to the opening verses of this gospel, right away, Mark introduces that purpose. He begins in verse 1, giving kind of a title to the gospel. He says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, most of you are aware, the word gospel means good news. Mark is saying, I'm bringing you good news. However, the goodness of that news hinges upon our answer to those three questions, doesn't it? Who is Jesus? What did he come to do? And how, how are we responding to him? This is good news that Mark is giving us, but it is good news only for those who see Christ as he is and who respond to him appropriately. When the introduction that follows Mark moves very quickly over material that other Gospels that um, Luke and Matthew spend a lot more time on. And he does it simply to set before us three initial testimonies about the identity of Christ. And in those testimonies, again, we are presented by these questions. Who is Christ? What did he come to do? And how are you responding to him? And so I want to look at this introduction in three parts. We'll see the voice in the wilderness and then the baptism in the wilderness, and then the conflict in the wilderness. So first in verses 2 to 8, we have the voice in the wilderness. The voice in the wilderness. Now the wilderness in Scripture is a place of great significance. You can trace it as a theme in the Old Testament. And one of the ways in which it is significant is that it is presented as the place to which God brings his people that they might meet with him. It's the place of covenant. It's the place of devotion between God and his people. When Moses came to Pharaoh, his initial call was to, that Pharaoh would let his people go. Why? That we might go three days into the wilderness to worship our God. When God eventually did deliver his people from Egypt, where did they go? Well, he led them into the wilderness of Sinai, and there God came down. He met with them, and he entered into covenant with them. You see, God takes his people away from the busyness, away from the distraction of life. And he brings them to a quiet place where they might hear his voice. Well, look at verse 4 and 5. We read that John appeared baptizing in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. So John comes as God's prophet, God's voice, the voice in the wilderness. And he's calling the people of Israel back to the wilderness, back to the place of devotion. In Hosea 2, God had said, prophesying of the time of restoration. He said, I will allure them and bring them back into the wilderness and I will woo them to myself and they will enter into as it were a marriage covenant with me. And so John is saying, come out, people of Jerusalem, people of Israel, come out from the formalistic, legalistic religion that has come to mark the religious leaders of Judaism and come back to the place of covenant faithfulness. Let your heart be turned back to the Lord and receive his mercy. Repent and confess your sins. And John is presented really as, as a picture of the final Old Testament prophet. His description in verse 6 has very clear allusions to the description of Elijah in 2 Kings 1. He's wearing a, a camel's hair and a, a leather belt is around his waist. And really his message sums up the message of the Old Testament prophets. If you wanted to really take everything down to its bare bones and summarize the, the message of all the Old Testament prophets, it would essentially be a call to repentance in preparation for, the God, for God's coming Savior. And the coming of John, of course, had long been foretold. Mark quotes in verses 2 and 3 both Malachi and Isaiah both of whom had declared that there would be a messenger who would go before the Messiah to prepare his way. And I want you to recognize the significance of this 
for the Jewish people, for the people of Israel. Everything that the Old Testament pointed to, everything that they were expecting after thousands of years, ever since that first promise in Genesis 3 was starting to come to pass, all the hopes of generation after generation after generation of Old Testament people were now being fulfilled. And John is like a herald. It goes before a king into a city and he walks through the streets attended with trumpets. And he wakes up the citizens of the city and says, the king is coming. Make yourselves ready. That you might receive him with honor. And it was a message, of course, that came with urgency because the king is at the very doorstep. He is coming and he is coming soon. There's no time to lose. This is good news. The king is coming and he's coming in salvation. However, that coming demands preparation. So what Mark wants to do as Mark sets before us the ministry of John is he wants to emphasize for us that John's ministry in the purpose of God, in the prophetic witness, John's ministry is ushering in the gospel age. It's bringing the gospel right before God's people. And so it makes sense, doesn't it, that right at the very core, right at the very center of John's message is not merely a call to repent, but it's also a testimony of the might, the worth, and the work of Christ. Look at verse 7. We read that John preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. In that culture, untying someone's sandals was the most menial of tasks. It was something that not even a Jewish slave would do. Similar to the idea of foot washing that we think of in John 13. It was left for the very lowest of the low, a task that was both disgusting and humiliating. Washing the dirt off feet or loosing the sandal strap. And John declares here, I am not even worthy even to do that to this one who is coming after me. You see, this is a man who is overwhelmed by the greatness and the worthiness of the one that he was pointing to, the one who was coming after him. And we know from the other Gospels that John was viewed with great reverence by the people of Israel. He was viewed as a mighty prophet. He was likened to Elijah himself. His, his bearing was impressive. His preaching was powerful. By his words, we see that John was very, very aware of his own unimportance. From John's perspective, his significance was, was just swallowed up. It was drowned next to the one who was coming after him. And we see this repeatedly in the Gospels. John shows himself to be a very humble man. He's constantly pointing away from himself and pointing to Christ. So again, you could go back to that picture of a herald going into a city before a king. And you can imagine that that herald goes into some city and he's attended by a great, um, a great crew of people following along behind him. He's dressed in bright clothing and he's been appointed to that task as a herald because he's the most eloquent speaker in the realm. And as he begins to declare to the people the coming of the king, the people become enamored with him. They start crowding around him. They think he's very eloquent and he's dressed very finely. And John is saying, don't let that happen. I am just the forerunner. Yes, God has, has given me a ministry. He's given me a message. But don't let your attention terminate on me. Prepare yourselves for the one who is coming after. It's actually a beautiful picture of what faithful gospel ministry should always be. Don't look at me. Look at him. Well, he says in verse 8, I've baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That is to say, the one who is coming, he's actually going to bring you into the very presence of God. The transforming Holy Spirit is going to come and indwell you through this man's ministry. So John the baptizer, the voice in the wilderness. John was a man sent by God to prepare the world for Christ. Now his message is strong. His message is urgent. But I want you to see 
that it all hinges upon the greatness and the worthiness of the one who is coming after him. What does the prophet Isaiah say? Prepare the way for whom? Prepare the way of the Lord. And you see, it's because of who he is, the mighty one, the worthy one. It's because of who he is that you must be prepared to meet him. There are so many false gospels in the world today. There are so many false notions in the church of a Jesus who demands nothing from us. Come as you are and stay as you are. A Jesus who costs us nothing. But my friends, the Christ that John proclaimed was not a Christ that we can approach with a casual attitude. He's the Lord of glory. And we are not even worthy to lick the dust from his feet. John's ministry forces us to ask the question, do you see Jesus as altogether worthy? Do you see that everything in this entire book, in this church that we go to week after week, that many of us have grown up in, do you see that it's all about him? And are you prepared to meet him? John was a voice crying in the wilderness, preparing the world to meet the Savior. Well, there's a second testimony to Christ in this passage. We have the voice in the wilderness. And then in verse 9 to 11, we have the baptism in the wilderness. The baptism in the wilderness. We read, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, was baptized by John in the Jordan. Now it's interesting, isn't it, that Jesus appears in obscurity. At this point in the narrative, there is nothing from the outside that, that would set him apart. Jesus comes, he, he hears the call of John in the wilderness, he comes out into the wilderness, and he stands with the rest of the crowd and listens to John's preaching like the rest of the people. He gets in line for his turn to be baptized just like the rest of the people. And as we think about John's baptism, a baptism of repentance, the, the question, of course, that confronts us is, why did Jesus need to be baptized? I mean, he was sinless. He was perfect. I want you to notice the clear parallel between verse 5 and verse 9. Both of them speak of people being baptized by John in the Jordan. But there's one very clear difference. In verse 9, there's no confession of sin. Jesus doesn't confess his sins as he's baptized. Now remember, we are dealing here with testimonies of, of who Christ is and what he came to do. Here he comes in obscurity, nothing special about him, and he's baptized, but he doesn't confess his sins. What, what is Christ doing? Christ had no sins of his own to confess. But Christ is being baptized as a testimony to the fact that that he came into the world to identify himself with sinners. Jesus didn't come to stand aloof from us. He didn't come to stand apart from us or to stand over us. Again, this is the man who is the mighty one. He's the worthy one. But as he begins his ministry, he engages in this very public act by which he, in essence, declares I have come to identify myself with my sinful people. I've come to stand in their place because I know their repentance will never be good enough. It'll never be perfect. And so I will undergo the baptism of repentance in their place. Though he was perfect, Christ is here standing in the place of sinners just as he will later do at the cross. And as he does so suddenly like a thin piece of cloth, the heavens are rent apart and the Holy Spirit descends. We read, and when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. In the Old Testament, both kings and priests, when they were called by God to their office, they would be anointed with oil. There's a picture of God anointing them with his Spirit, setting them apart and equipping them for their task. We read in 1 Samuel 16 that when David was anointed, we read that as soon as Samuel poured the anointing oil on his head, 
we read that the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him from that day forward. So here we are. No sooner have we been given a hint of what Christ's work will be. No sooner does Christ visibly commit himself to standing in the place of sinners. The spirit of God comes upon him to equip him and empower him for the work that is set before him. And directly following this, the voice thunders from heaven. You are my beloved son, and with you I am well pleased. It is awesome to think of what is compressed in these few words. God the Son, God, God the Son, stands on the bank of the river, having just visibly committed himself to the work of salvation. God the Holy Spirit comes upon him and fills him and anoints him for his calling. And God the Father declares, I am delighted with my son who is undertaking to save sinners. It's the whole triune God saying we are committed to the work of redemption. This morning I quoted from Isaiah 42 in connection with Haggai 2, but it's here that we see the the fulfillment, the ultimate fulfillment of that prophecy. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. My friends, again, we have here a very clear witness regarding the identity and the purpose of Christ. He is the obedient son, beloved by the father, anointed by the spirit. And if we failed to hear the witness of John, if we failed to hear John's preaching, let us not fail to hear the preaching of the triune God who is saying, this is my beloved son, identifying with sinners, equipped by my spirit, going forth to bring me pleasure by giving his life as a ransom for sinners. Just as John was pointing to Jesus and saying to us, pay attention to him. Now God himself, Heaven is opening and saying, pay attention to him. There's no one who has entered history who is more important than this man. Pay attention to him. And so in John, we saw the world being prepared for Christ. Here we see Christ being prepared for his ministry. And in both of them, there is a very clear witness that this is the son of God the promised Messiah, the Savior of the world. Once again, the question confronts us. What do you think of Jesus? Who do you say that he is? Well, there's one more important testimony of Christ in this opening passage. We have the voice in the wilderness, the baptism in the wilderness, But thirdly, in verses 12 and 13, we have the conflict in the wilderness. The conflict in the wilderness. I want you to think back with me to the Old Testament again. I want you to think about the nation of Israel. After they are delivered from Egypt, what happens? Well, they pass through the waters of the Red Sea, which the Apostle Paul actually tells us is a picture of baptism. Baptized in the Red Sea in which they die to their old life of slavery. They're raised again to a new life as God's people. And then they come to Sinai, and God comes down to dwell among them, in a sense anointing them. And God declares to them, you are my beloved people, and I'm setting you apart for my calling, for my work. And then what happens? Well, then they enter into the wilderness. And God goes before them and leads them into the wilderness that stands between Canaan and and Sinai, and there they are tested and they are tempted with deprivation and with trial. Look at verse 12 and 13. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. The Spirit drove him into the wilderness. It's the same word that is actually used when we read of Christ casting out demons, driving out demons. 
It speaks of irresistible force. It speaks of Christ being compelled by the Spirit. And Christ is in the wilderness 40 days, just as Israel was 40 years in the wilderness, just as Moses was 40 days on Mount Sinai. Now, what is going on here? What is going on is that Jesus has just identified himself with his sinful people. And now we see him walking the very footsteps that his people have trodden, walking along the history of Israel, fulfilling every part. Jesus is fulfilling in himself, overcoming the trials where they failed, and fulfilling in himself everything that Israel was supposed to be. And what happens in the wilderness is a great confrontation. I said earlier that the wilderness is a symbol of the place where God meets with his people, where he enters into covenant with them. However, it is also true that the wilderness is a place of testing. It's a place of conflict. And it's significant that just as Israel, after Sinai, they didn't go directly, they didn't end up directly in the promised land, but they had to travel through the wilderness. It's significant that Christ, after his baptism, doesn't go directly into Jerusalem. He goes to the wilderness. He's driven into the wilderness to enter into conflict with Satan. It's interesting, Mark, Mark doesn't even know that Jesus overcame. It says he was in the wilderness being tempted by Satan. He doesn't even mention that Christ overcame Satan in the wilderness. Luke and Matthew both do that. And the reason is because Mark wants to emphasize that the conflict didn't end here. In fact, this was just the beginning of the conflict. Christ's time in the wilderness is really just a little picture of Christ's entire life and ministry, which was going to be one continual conflict with Satan and with the demons and with sin. Christ's life right up until his death was what we call his humiliation. It was a time of hardship, a time of trial. He was sustained by angels. Yes, we could think of Gethsemane, but he's with the wild beasts. He's in a place of danger, a place of deprivation. And it's here that he enters into conflict with Satan. My friends, in this third scene, we have another testimony of who Jesus is and what he came to do. Again, remember who he is. This is the mighty one. He's the worthy one. He's the anointed one. He's the beloved one. He's the very son of God. But he has not come into this world in the way that we might have expected. He didn't come in the way that the Jews expected. He didn't come to dwell in the luxury of ivory palaces with pomp and ceremony attended by servants. No, he came to do battle with the forces of darkness and sin. He came to engage in a great conflict in the wilderness of this world, tempted and tried and suffering. I didn't come to serve, to be served. I came to serve <laughs> And to give my life as a ransom for many. And again, we go back to those questions of Mark. Who is this Jesus? And what did he come to do? Do you see how in these opening verses, Mark is hinting already at the answers that he's going to expand upon to those questions. As we stand before this brief picture of the wilderness preparation of Christ... As we think about all that, that Mark is trying to show us, I want to take us back a moment to verses 1, 2, and 3. Mark declared in verse 1 that this was the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the good news. So the question is, is this good news? Is this good news for you? See, the answer to that question rests completely upon your understanding of who Jesus is and what he came to do. It rests completely on your response to his coming. In verses 2 and 3, Mark actually brings together two different Old Testament prophecies. We read them both. The first is taken from Malachi 3, the second from Isaiah 40. And while both of them very clearly show us that it is the Lord himself who is following his messenger, there's a very different context to the two prophecies. Isaiah 40 is the beginning of really what is the fullest section of, 
of Old Testament prophecy dealing with the coming of God's salvation. Isaiah 40 to 66. It's a section that centers on Isaiah 53. The atoning work of the suffering servant. And the verses right before the verse that Mark quotes say this. Comfort. Comfort my people. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Her warfare is ended and her iniquity is pardoned. The voice in the wilderness is coming saying, the Lord is coming in salvation. He's bringing news of deliverance, of forgiveness, of mercy. That is good news. However, in Malachi 3, I find it very interesting. The image is very, very different. Listen to how it begins. You have wearied the Lord with your words. But you say, how have we wearied him? By saying, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord and he delights in them. Or by asking, where is the God of justice? You see, Malachi's prophecy comes in the context of people who are saying, we're just going to keep on living in sin, but God delights in us. We're just going to take sin lightly and God will be pleased with us. It's in the context of a people who are mocking the God of justice. And God declares that his messenger, his forerunner is coming. And then the Lord is going to follow him. But then Malachi says this. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. He has come to save, yes, But he has also come to purify. Malachi will go on to talk about how he is going to purify some so that there will be a pure people offering pure sacrifices. But then he'll go on to talk about judgment. How the Lord who comes to his temple will be a swift witness against the ungodly. And against those who want to hold on to their sins. And who do not fear the Lord. And so in light of that, is it any wonder that John comes to us with a message of repentance? He's preparing the way of the one who will bring salvation, yes, but he's preparing the way for the one whose coming cannot be endured by sinful men. He's coming to prepare the way for one who is burning with holiness, one who is a consuming fire. And so John says, people of Israel... There is preparation needed when Jesus comes. Humble yourselves, confess your sins, turn from your sins, and prepare yourself to meet him. Is this message good news? Is it good news for you? It depends. Are you ready for his coming? Are you prepared to meet him? We're going to be faced again and again in the Gospel of Mark with these questions. What do you think of Jesus? What do you think of what he came to do? How are you responding to his coming? And your response, the answer to the third question, will stand in direct connection to who you understand of who he is and what he's come to do. Your preparation of heart, the measure to which you prepare your heart, will be in direct proportion to your faith. In the fact that he is truly the son of God who has come to give his life as a ransom for sinners. And so Mark's whole purpose in this introduction, really in the entire book, is to convince his readers, is to convince you and to convince me that this is indeed the promised Messiah. He is the son of God, the mighty one, the worthy one the anointed one, the beloved one, the suffering one, the atoning one, the one who has come to enter into conflict with Satan and so crush his head for our salvation. As we enter into this series, I can think of no better question to leave us with than this. Are you prepared to meet him? Are you prepared to meet him in the pages of scripture in the gospel? And are you prepared to meet him in judgment? Because one way or another, you have to meet him. Either you meet him through this book, and you bow at his feet, and you know him, and you receive him, and you say, this is good news.
or you meet him in judgment, or he comes as a consuming fire. May God give us grace to answer those questions rightly. Who is he? What has he come to do? And are you prepared to meet him? Amen. Let us pray. Our glorious God in heaven, we stand in awe before the testimony of our Lord Jesus Christ, before the weight of his glory, the weight of his goodness, before the testimony of who he is, before the testimony of what he has come to do. Our glorious triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for the work of salvation that you have wrought. Gracious God, give us hearts to receive it. Come by your spirit and prepare us, Lord, to meet Christ. Go through this room and search every heart. Expose us, convict us, humble us, and draw us to the foot of Christ. Show us his glory, Lord, that we might live as his people, that you might be glorified in us. We thank you for your word, and we thank you for your Savior. And we pray in his name. Amen.